Uh, so we hope that Zimbabwe comes in in a minute. Um, but before it is that far and before I will present you, I'm inviting our uh, business down, director, bring me up. Johan van Dijk, to, to formally the, introduce that. this series of yeah, seminars. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Dear students here in Delft, but also dear students online in many places of uh, the world, you are connected to us now. Welcome to Nisco IT. My name is uh, Johan van Dijk and I'm the business director of the Institute. And it's my uh, pleasure to have you here for this seminar, Water and the Sustainable Development Goals, a vision for healthy people and healthy environment. This seminar is for you here, students in the, uh, in the audience. Uh, but it also is to mark the UNESCO IHC Alumni Day that we have celebrated uh, last week. And in connection to this event, we are proud to have this first online seminar that's also open to our alumni. For the students here, um, I hope that uh, most of you have been in a position to uh, attend last day opening of the uh, academic year 2016, um, where I already mentioned that you are now part of a big family, as a matter of fact, 15,000 alumni big, because that's the number of students that have graduated from the Institute since 1957. And since these first lectures, we have developed not only our Education. Hello, today. good morning everyone. Our research and innovation and what we call our capacity development and institutional strengthening. But we also come to this online seminar and that's just the latest uh, development in uh, sharing knowledge and skills with you. Today we are uh, in the experience hands of Professor uh, Tyson. I can see him on the screen on the other side in South Africa. Welcome here. Rick is the regional director and regional office for South Africa in Nairobi. He's the UNESCO representative to Botswana, Lesotho, Malawi, South Africa, Swaziland, Zimbabwe, and uh, Zambia and to the uh, Southern region, and he serves at the UN regional team in Africa, and of course, touch to the UNESCO where I achieved us. I think we will uh, speak at the same time, I uh, hope so. Uh, let me say again, hello to you, and then we can say hello to the audience here with us. Okay, I will uh, just the details of the program will be in the hands of uh, Mark Sibyl and uh, I welcome you all and I wish you a very inspiring seminar, the first of its kind here in this place. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Johan, for this uh, introductory words, celebrating indeed that first time seminar for alumni. Um, well, Huub is already there, and I trust Huub that your sound system is working. Uh, let me do a slight little bit further of your introduction. Um, Huub has quite an impressive um, resume, CV, um, implemented short missions, team leaders, additional to what Johan already said, team leader of a number of bigger projects, among which the switch project called Water in the City of the Future, in which we were joining forces um, with many other organizations in the world to 
yeah, to develop to water management is the objective obviously to reduce water consumption to maintain high water qualities. Um, besides his current work at UNESCO, regional director and representative, he continues to hold positions as full professor at UNESCO IHE, this institute, uh, since 1995 and at Wageningen University. Um, Hubert has published over 400 articles and books and presented numerous keynotes in the field of water management, microbiology, environmental sciences, biotechnology, sanitary and environmental engineering. And he also covers topics on international cooperation, in which he, of course, is in the middle. Sustainable development, the Millennium Development Goals, the Sustainability Development Goals, and climate change and serves on the boards of many important institutions. Um, from his background here, he joined UNESCO in 2006 as director of the UNESCO Regional Science Bureau, as Johan already was mentioning. Uh, yes, Martin, I can hear you loud and clear. Let me also check if you can hear me from Harare. Regional Office for Southern Africa in Harare and a UNESCO representative for a whole bunch of Southern African countries. Um, so far for the introduction, let's get started. And uh, let me also check whether you have the first slide on the screen. That is the title slide. Ben. OK. The method is not better be here. It's noise. Yes. Yeah, we found that out. Okay, thank you. So let me first of all say it is a great pleasure for me to join you uh, over there. Uh, I believe this is the new batch of students joining the IG programs, uh, and it's very good that in this first week you're all together, um, so that we uh, uh, we have a chance to discuss uh, about some of the, the the common issues and challenges in the in the water sector. Um, and now I'm happy science. to be connected, I'm happy to be again with what UNESCO IG. Uh, yeah. I'm still uh, engaged with UNESCO IG, uh, but as uh, Martin uh, already indicated in the introduction, I work now uh, full-time for UNESCO uh, and I'm based uh, currently here in Harare, which is a new regional office for UNESCO. Um, now, uh, actually, uh, uh, I hope many of you know uh, today is a very special day. It is uh, UN Day. Uh, and therefore, uh, while I will focus my presentation on water and the SDGs, uh, I would like to share a few introductory comments on water. I, I don't know, I'm not sure, do I hear my own echo back or was there a comment? I can continue, I guess. So, next slide. Uh, this is the logo of the uh, UN Day celebrations, uh, 71 for 17. Uh, that means 71 years of experience of the UN to support the 17 uh, SDGs. Uh, next. Yeah, you will uh, know that uh, the United Nations was born in 1945, exactly on this day, 21st, uh, 24th of October. And uh, the UN is, is central to global efforts uh, to address challenges and problems uh, faced by humanity. And uh, to uh, address these uh, huge global challenges, uh, we have over 30 affiliated uh, organizations in the UN system. Uh, UNESCO is one of them. Uh, next. And, and what does the UN do? Uh, basically, we work in uh, six areas. The first is uh, to support uh, economic development, uh, to work on social progress, uh, uh, international law, uh, and actually next doors from Delft in The Hague, there is the International uh, Court of Justice, uh, to uh, promote issues of human rights, uh, and last uh, but not least, the achievement of world peace. Next. Now, the UN has, of course, different images. Uh, when you think of the UN, anything may come in mind. The acronym of UN, uh, some people tell me, uh, well, it's useless nations. Um, 
some say uh, UN is unable, uh, and it is indeed sometimes difficult. Uh, the UN is also confused sometimes, and by some, as the Security Council, which indeed is a bit of an archaic system in the UN uh, with veto powers. Uh, but actually, uh, what the UN is, uh, uh, it is you and me. It is all of us together. It is all the member states together. And that's, I would say, the success of the UN. At the same time, it is sometimes the source of frustration because you need to agree with uh, 194 member states to be able to make uh, progress and advances. Uh, next. Now, let me come to the theme of water. And I believe water is a good theme because it, uh, uh, it embodies the whole uh, issue of uh, the need for cooperation, the, lead, the need for multilateralism. Uh, water doesn't recognize borders. Uh, water is a basic human need. Uh, water is life. Uh, water is a basic human right. So uh, the current Secretary General, when he started his mandate eight years ago, almost eight years ago, uh, he launched this uh, term. He said, climate change is the defining issue of our time. And I express hope here that Considering that uh, over 90% of climate change impact is water related, I hope the new Secretary General will come out and say, actually, water is the defining issue of our time. Now, let me make the case for that in the presentation. Next. First of all, uh, water is life. Now, this picture embodies this. This is a picture taken from the moon. There is no water, there is no life, uh, it is a dead, uh, it is a dead uh, body, actually, the moon. And what we see over there on the horizon is planet Earth. And the only color you recognize is white and it is blue. And this symbolizes water. It is the oceans and the clouds. And therefore, there is life on this uh, fantastic planet Earth. Next. And that reflects, uh, therefore, on the, on the roles of water. Uh, water is essential for our food production. Uh, more than 70% of all the fresh water used goes to produce our food. Next. We need water for people, drinking water, washing water, bathing water, household water. Next. Uh, we need water to run our industries. Next. We use water to produce energy, uh, very important in this region. Uh, we use water for transportation. Uh, we use water, uh, it is important in recreation and tourism. Think of it, this is one of the biggest economic sectors today. Uh, whenever we have free time for recreation or go on tourism, we look for water. Next. And uh, after all these uh, uses for people, we sometimes forget that water is also essential for nature. Um, for the ecosystems to support the biodiversity. Next. Now here a reflection on uh, how much water uh, do we use and, uh, and the increase in water, in freshwater consumption over the past 100 years or so. And you see a very steep increase. Uh, first of all, on the left, the, the most thirsty sector, as I said already, is uh, agriculture. Uh, the production of our food uh, will be a huge challenge for the second half of this century. It is a major question that needs to be addressed and resolved. The second biggest user is domestic use, water for people. And the third biggest user is industry. And these two sectors, uh, and I could in fact include the first one also, agriculture, not only they use a lot of fresh water, but also after using it, they return it back to nature, but usually at a, at a very much inferior quality. So pollution comes in. And that presents another major challenge in the water sector. Uh, very briefly, next slide on uh, why is water so important for UNESCO? In UNESCO, water is a, is a principal priority in the science sector, the S of UNESCO. Uh, and we have, therefore, in Paris, uh, the, the so-called Division of Water Sciences uh, that manages the IHP program, the International Hydrological Program, which is a, a global cooperation between scientists on hydrology and water. 
Uh, UNESCO also hosts uh, the Secretariat for a UN-wide program called the World Water Assessment Program that comes up with a report every year. Uh, you see here the third pillar is UNESCO IG. It's you over there in Delft, uh, which is the capacity building uh, and the research component of the water program. And then besides that, the fourth pillar is uh, uh, a large number of specialized centers all over the world, uh, category two, we call them centers uh, in the field of water, and also UNESCO chairs at universities. Next slide. So that briefly on UNESCO, but back to the global challenges as we face them in the water sector. Uh, the first category of challenges relate to water and people. How does water affect us? Uh, today, uh, close to 0.8 billion people live without access to safe water. So that remains a big challenge also in SDG 6. Over 2.5 billion people have no access to improved sanitation. Um, some, some 5 billion people globally live near polluted water bodies. Contamination and the, the, the contact with that uh, potentially causing disease. Uh, and therefore, millions, uh, often children, die from waterborne disease today. Um, we, we see that uh, still there is a challenge of hunger and food security, with uh, 850 million people living in food insecure situations. Uh, and I list that here under water for people challenges, because the main limiting factor to increase our food production today is water. And then we have, of course, climate change. We caused it ourselves but it has impacted the hydrological cycle, which today is very erratic. Next. Then we have another set of challenges that I would categorize under water quantity and water quality challenges. Uh, we see a sharp increase in worldwide water use. Uh, there is over abstraction. Uh, there is land subsidence and desertification as a result of it. Um, we, we see that 85% of the population globally lives in the, in the, in the, in the driest half of the planet. Uh, and, and climate change uh, and extreme weather events is making it much, much more difficult. Um, this causes food insecurity. Um, we see also rapid urbanization processes taking place in many countries and that increases water footprints uh, in on the catchment. Uh, and I referred already to the massive pollution of vital water resources, be it via point source pollution, sewage, uh, industrial uh, effluents, but also non-point sources. Think of this. Agriculture is a major contaminant uh, because of, and then oftentimes of very nasty chemicals like pesticides. Uh, but think of it, this doesn't come out of a pipe. This is uh, diffuse pollution that cannot be easily collected and treated. So a major issue. Uh, and also nitrogen, the fertilizer, is of course meant to uh, stimulate growth of crops, but most of it, it gets lost via the water, infiltrates into our groundwater and surface water systems. Um, biodiversity loss uh, is, is another major challenge that I uh, list here under these uh, uh, long list of, of water challenges. Uh, next slide. And uh, it is a, a defining moment in time uh, because we have early this year uh, uh, closed the MDG chapter, the global efforts to support the Millennium Development Goals, eight of them, and turned the page to a new agenda, which is a much more complex and comprehensive agenda. A few words on that uh, new agenda in the next slide. You see here the set, in the next slide, uh, the set of 17 goals, and of course a particular interest today is goal number six. Uh, goal number six here says clean water and sanitation, but I should emphasize that uh, the goal, if you look at the text, it, is, it goes much further than that. It is not just the water for people component, it includes uh, water management, uh, pollution, water quantity, water quality issues. In fact, it intends to address all the lists of challenges that I presented just a minute ago. Uh, and that makes it a comprehensive, uh, 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 a comprehensive goal. Uh, next. So, uh, water also relates to all these other uh, uh, sustainable development goals. I, I predict none of them will move forward in the way we plan them 
uh, if we don't uh, manage the water goal. Next slide. Well, this, this picture is, is basically meant to, uh, to say we, we need to zoom out and see the bigger picture of, of the issues. And when you see 17 goals, a long list, in fact, uh, personally, I criticize this, uh, this, not the process, but the, the result of having 17 goals, uh, which are very hard to memorize and to understand. Uh, this is a very complex agenda uh, and, and it, it could have been simplified because the main issues are fewer. Um, and, and therefore, I, I would like to ask us to, to zoom out and see the bigger picture. What is the bigger picture at stake? Uh, now, this is a picture, uh, you see it, it is, it is a, a gun, it is a symbol of violence and killings and all the bad. But then to the next slide, you see the big picture. Next. You see really that the, the, the big picture is, is that of a, this is a monument uh, for peace. It is exactly the opposite. And this is what happens if you zoom out and look at the bigger picture. Uh, I believe this is the time to do that. If we zoom out and, and see the 17 goals, we see a bigger picture that looks more simple. Next slide. The bigger picture is this one. It is a picture where basically the Agenda 2030 entails three main pillars. The first one uh, being the unfinished business of the MDGs on, on the right hand bottom. Uh, that is the, 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 uh, uh, the challenge of eradicating poverty uh, and associated uh, syndromes uh, of, of health and access to services and food. Then we have the big question of sustainable development. Uh, and, 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 and a green economy. And, and the third one, uh, equally important, is the big question of peace and security. So, in a way, I have captured here the whole SDG 17 goals in three simple pillars. Next slide. Now, back to water and uh, how it relates to all the other uh, SDGs. Uh, I have tried to make a, a, a qualitative assessment of that. Uh, let's go back to the SDGs. Uh, water was locked up under uh, Goal 7, Target 7C. It was very limited uh, in its positioning in the SDGs. And Target 7C was limited in itself again because it was only talking about water and sanitation. Uh, th therefore, in today's uh, framework of the SDGs, it is much broader. And you see here, I, I just uh, with pluses, uh, I have tried to indicate whether water is an important dimension in the particular SDG. And you see, for all the SDGs, it is uh, very relevant. The more pluses, the more relevant. And of course, the, the biggest number of pluses is earned by SDG 6, which is particularly on water. Next slide. For the other uh, SDGs, you see the same. Uh, and I've given uh, four pluses to, in particular, uh, SDG 11, sustainable cities. How can a city be sustainable if we don't manage a sustainable water system for these cities? Uh, sustainable production and consumption. Uh, climate action. Uh, and also uh, save the oceans. That's where the bulk of our water is on this planet. It is in the oceans. Uh, next slide. So, as I said, the, the zooming out is useful because then you tend to see the bigger picture. Now, if, if you have to deal with 17 SDGs, that can sometimes be very complicated. I, I, I would say zooming out uh, would, should learn us that there are key issues and they are interlinked. Uh, if you look at food, water, energy, that is a nexus that, that should be considered together. They are very closely linked. But now let's dream uh, a bit. We go beyond 2030 and we would have solved the, the food security, the water issues and the energy. If we would have done that, then we would have solved many of the other problems listed in other SDGs. We would have no more climate change. We have new renewable energy. We have solved the, the food security issues, which drive also a lot of climate change emissions accountable for some 30% of global climate change. We, we would have sustainable uh, uh, water management systems and therefore biodiversity loss, no more uh, a problem. Uh, environmental sustainability is, is there. 
uh, and it would also uh, address other issues of poverty and inequalities. So the, 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 what I'm saying here is that by zooming out, you see the main issues, uh, the, 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 the strategic issues that are catalytic and can help address and solve the other SDGs. Next. Next. Uh, sorry. Yeah, this one. And so therefore, uh, I would say uh, the, the agenda 2030, it, it, it uses new language as well. It talks about transformative change, transformative shifts. But zooming out and looking at the key strategic issues, uh, I would identify these three sectors, energy, water and food. And if we manage to transform these three sectors, we would basically have addressed the whole list of SDGs and made transformative change towards a new world down the road in the second half of this century that is truly sustainable. Next. And therefore I say this transformative change should lead to new energy, it will lead to new water, and it will lead to new food. And now you ask, well, what, what is that? Well, that is what I'm going to explain in the second half of this presentation. But up front, I would say, what it also needs is a new mindset. We need to be open, we need to be innovative, and we need to drive uh, this world towards sustainability. Next. Now, to illustrate the, the point, let me first uh, explain the, the current unsustainable use of water. Two examples, water for food security, as I said, 70% of our fresh water goes there. And the second example is water for sustainable cities or settlements, or it, it, it applies equally in villages and settlements. Next. So first, the water for food. As I said earlier, uh, how, how, uh, the challenge is how to provide food security for 9 billion people in 2050. With when today already 70% of our fresh water goes there. Do we have that water available? Um, so I, I always say today the key limiting factor to increase our food production is water. Of course it is also available land and then we also need to recognize that our current food production is not sustainable as it is today because it is uh, causing too much uh, environmental setup climate change gas emissions, pollution of, of nasty chemicals, etc. Next. And that is what we, uh, 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 what is presented here. Uh, we, we uh, FAO did some calculations and, and they have calculated that in order to feed sustainably 250, in, in 2050, 9 billion people, uh, we need to increase food production by 60%. Uh, and in some of the, in most of the developing countries, by 100%. But what does that mean for our fresh water, uh, for our water in terms of quantity and quality? And, and my prediction is, if everything stays the same as it is, this will lead to a massive water quality and water quality crisis. Next. And therefore, uh, I, I use this term uh, that was launched by the Club of Rome in the 70s. There are limits to growth. Um, and if you look at our current food production system, uh, which is in fact the result of a Neolithic revolution, huh? it, is, uh, it is about 11, 12,000 years back, that we decided as a species to, instead of hunting and gathering, to, to settle and grow our food, uh, that system has, uh, have been, has been carried forward basically in the same way for uh, the last 11 uh, or more thousand years. And uh, I would say that, uh, again, zooming out the big picture, uh, we're probably coming to the end of the shelf life of the Neolithic Revolution. Uh, let's reflect on that. Why, why do I make that statement? Well, if you analyze what the impact is of our food production system, you see that it occupies 25% of all uh, habitable land. It is responsible for 70% of our freshwater consumption, for 80% of deforestation, for 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. It is the largest driver of biodiversity loss. And it is, and I refer to that, uh, 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 a big contaminator, but of diffuse pollution that is very difficult to manage. 
but also, uh, and especially the bio industry, it creates a number of ethical issues, uh, both in the bio industry, but also agriculture. I mean, think of it. We always romanticize agriculture and farming, and uh, think of these these poor uh, rural farmers in rural Africa. Um, it is it is it is hardship to make a living out of agriculture, small scale uh, in rural areas. So these issues are there. Um, and uh, next slide, uh, we sorry the the yeah the next slide I want to introduce the the second example. This one, can you run the animation uh, back one slide back and then start it again? It doesn't run. Next. Yeah, something. Yeah, now it runs. Okay. So, the, the water for cities or settlements. What we see is our system is simple. We have a water resource. We take water from there. We treat it to the highest quality of drinking water. The distribution network, high consumption in the cities, in households, industries, etc. That generates a lot of wastewater, sewage, that needs to be collected in big pipes under the streets, a sewage, a sewer network. Then hopefully at the end of the pipe we have a treatment plant that brings back this water to a decent quality. And then you see the effluent go back and usually it goes back to the same resource where it came from. The, the big wide arrow is, is the biggest uh, consumer and that's the food security part. The food production consumes 70% of fresh water but also generates the brown arrow back a lot of pollution. So you see that in fact water in the city and water in, in, in settlements runs in a cycle. And we have learned that running things cyclic is, is good, it's sustainable. So why bother? Next slide. Uh, you would wonder, is there anything wrong with water in the city today? It is cyclic and it should be sustainable, therefore. Next slide. Yeah, the, uh, the objectives, if, if you want to know if it is sustainable, we have to go back to the original objectives. Urban water management basically has three objectives. If you look at it, the, the objectives are uh, to provide a good service to people and industry, to improve public health, that is how the uh, water, the urban water system uh, was developed in the, from the second half of the 19th century, the discovery of microorganisms. I think I'm back, correct? Yeah, I'm back. I don't know where I lost you, but let's go to the next slide. I'm reviewing our progress over the last 150 years against these three objectives. Let's see, next slide. Well, first of all, good service to people. Uh, but is, is this a good service to people? If today uh, 0.8 billion people have no access to safe water, if 2.5 billion people don't have ac access to sanitation, and if 5 billion people and more live close to contaminated water, I don't think we, we have a good uh, result under this objective. Next slide. And is it a good service to people if we use too much of this high-end quality water, drinking water, for very low-end purposes? Uh, do, we need, do we need drinking water to wash a Coca-Cola truck? Or on the right-hand side, as you can see, do we need drinking water to flush our toilet? When the single purpose is the transportation of human waste. Uh, Martin, I hear a very strong echo of my own voice. Can you, can you do something about it? 
and in the meantime I continue. So a good service to people also when we have climate change and uh, and, and we see there is either too little or there, it comes in, in too big quantities. Next slide. Then the other objective, that of uh, improving public health. Well, uh, water is life, we know it, uh, indeed. But water is also a major killer. And millions of children, mostly children, die every year uh, from water. Next slide, yeah. Uh, next slide. Then the third objective, let's hope at least the third one we have addressed, that of environmental sustainability. And as you can see here in the picture, uh, we have invested billions in some regions, in the US, in the EU, uh, hundreds of billions over the past years to treat end of pipe the big amounts of sewage from industrial and domestic. Um, so high-tech treatment is, is really costing a, a, a fortune. Uh, and it, it helps to reduce the pollution to our water bodies. But let's remind ourselves, next slide, we still, by treating, we still do not produce safe effluents. After primary, secondary, tertiary treatment, you're still left with endocrine, disruptors, pathogens, microcontaminants. And then worse, next slide, we see that uh, some 75% of all wastewater in this world is not treated at all. And this is a, a, a sewer outlet to a river in the city of Cali in Colombia. And you can truly see that uh, this is a bridge over troubled water. Next slide. So we need to think in terms of water solutions. We need to get it right. And, and therefore we propose uh, this strategy that is composed of three steps. A strategy that, um, that has the following three steps. First of all, reduce water use, consumption. Second, reuse water after the first use. Today we use water only once in large amounts and then throw it away back to the water resource with a lot of pollution. So, reuse. Uh, think in terms of the water chain. Uh, and then, Third, uh, if you already have reduced the contamination in the effluents, you cannot reduce it further and it has to go back to the water resource. Think about measures. How can we have the water resource to cope better? Next. Then, uh, let's go through these steps. Some examples. Uh, the first step, reduce use. Now, that of course involves uh, demand management. Uh, water saving technologies, cleaner production. Uh, next slide. We have seen cleaner production in industry, but we need to apply it to the biggest user of water, the agriculture, the food production industry. Uh, so uh, more crop per drop. Uh, think about drought resistant uh, crops. Think about drip irrigation. Uh, further innovation needs to happen there. That's where the biggest consumption happens. Domestic use. You see here on the left a photo of a, of a super super toilet that does a lot of things and minimizes water use. And on the right hand side, you see low tech solutions are also possible. What you see here is uh, this is taken in, a, in rural China in a small restaurant. Uh, there's a washing basin. But the washing water is, is kept in a container which is used for the next guest for the flushing of the toilet. So you use the same water twice. That's the whole principle. Next slide. Step two, treat for reuse. That means water is also a, wastewater is also a resource. The, the organic matter could be turned into energy uh, via anaerobic digestion, for instance. Uh, the, you could recover the nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. So there is a lot of resources to be gained from wastewater. And in recovering them, you purify the effluent and make it fit for reuse, be it irrigation or otherwise. Next slide. An example of that is using eco-technologies. This is a very simple wastewater treatment lagoon. 
and you see the surface is green uh, and this is because on the on the surface uh, uh, grows uh, a tiny aquatic plant which is called the uh, lemna uh, or duckweed in english uh, and and it, it it is a very particular plant it, it has a, a very high growth speed it has a mass doubling time uh, that uh, comes in the order of, of microorganisms almost uh, within a day it could duplicate its biomass in in uh, full scale systems it will take two to four days and the biomass will double the second characteristic and that's shown in the next slide is that it has a very high uh, a very high protein content. Uh, I compare it here with uh, a hectare production uh, of soybean which produces 600 kilogram of protein but duckweed can produce 10 times as much per hectare per year. So that makes it a very interesting uh, product. It can be used for fish aquaculture. Next slide. You can see an example here in Bangladesh. Uh, this NGO that operates this system produces between 11 and 12 tons of uh, aquaculture fish production uh, per hectare per year, um, which I, I believe is a very high yield. Next. So then the last step. If after all these treatment and reuse processes we still have contamination, then how can we help the, our water system scope? Uh, think about eco-hydrology. Uh, this is a picture in the Netherlands. Um, I, I don't remember exactly which river, but it is typical to see dikes along the rivers. Now, the more recent approach is one where we say, well, let's give the space back to our rivers. Uh, let's cut the dikes where possible, where agricultural land can be used uh, to be flooded. Because originally, these rivers had the space uh, to, to, to grow if there is a big flow of water and to shrink when there is less water. And also think of it, it is exactly in these uh, uh, lower uh, areas where the water expands, where, which are biologically the most active. It is more shallow, light penetrates, algae can grow and bring oxygen into the water. So uh, in fact, uh, these are the, these areas that we cut out via the dikes. Um, are actually the kidneys of the river. Next. And by using the same principles of eco-hydrology, you can also apply these in tidal flushes. You see here the city of Cartagena. It uh, dumps its wastewater into this natural lagoon to the north, but there is a connection to the sea on the left. And what they have done in a, in a very interesting project is to engineer the entrance. In the next slide, you can see how polluted it was. This was before. Here you see the road over the bridge that connects on the other side, side to the sea. And it was massively contaminated, very smelly, very bad. Next slide. So engineering this, you see there is a separator in the middle. There are opening doors on the right and closing doors on the left. These doors open and close with the tidal effect, so no energy is used and seawater is thereby pumped through the system, diluting the waste, but then also allowing uh, uh, heterotrophic bacteria and algae to kick in and help in the purification process. So this is a very simple eco-hydrology application and in fact an eco-technology application. Next slide. So these are some examples of the three steps that we can take, but we need to go further. We need to think of a vision towards the year 2050 where we need to rebalance between people and planet. A vision where 9 billion people can live in a decent quality of life uh, within the planet's limited resources. Uh, next slide. Yeah, this is uh, what I call the power of imagination. And you all have that power. And I would ask you, can you reflect on the basis of all these challenges and problems that we have seen and envision a world out there somewhere in the second half of this century where we have indeed managed to rebalance? How would it look like? Next slide. Next slide. 
So new energy, well, uh, we have so many options and possibilities. I, I predict that we will enter now in a period where a number of these uh, renewable energy options will come to scale. But eventually, we will have to see a competition and selection process between various options. And I predict that uh, in, in, the, in the two decades after, uh, so towards 2040, 2050, we will probably narrow the options down to two or three main renewable sources. Next. Uh, new water. Well, Imagine what new water means. That means a more rational approach to water use, reuse, and helping ecosystem scope and water system scope. Next slide. So it means uh, we need to think of waterscapes in our uh, urban systems uh, and in our settlements. Uh, a large city should have a, a large water body within the city uh, at, at certain distances. These should be positioned in the lowest area so they can collect water when it rains. Uh, it becomes then also a buffer for the dry season. You can use that water. The bottom will be fully engineered to maximize recharge to the aquifer. And it is it has also an aesthetic function. Next. It, it becomes also very practical. You cannot afford to keep these water bodies empty. So you have houses that are floating on these water bodies. And you see on the right hand side, that is an animation, but the left hand side is a new company building casco houses. You can finish them to your own taste. And imagine the, the advantage this gives. Uh, let's uh, see in the next slide. If you find a new job in another city, you don't need to pack and unpack. You just hire a boat and go with your house. Uh, fantastic uh, advantage. Next slide. slide. Then the, the city of the future will also um, ration, make more rational uh, systems for our, our personal waste, human waste. The, the fecal matter will be collected, will no longer be washed by drinking water out of the city, causing problems, uh, but it will be uh, transported via vacuum. It goes to decentralized, fully automated, underground composting systems. Uh, the surface on the top is a park or a sports park, uh, multiple use of space. But underground, the first generation will produce uh, methane gas, biogas. The second generation in 20 years will produce hydrogen gas. And this is a co-composting, uh, anaerobically of, of course, between the fecal matter and the organic portion of uh, municipal solid waste. The, the energy goes back to, uh, to, to drive the vacuum, to, to run echo systems or heating systems in the houses. Next. Then the urine, which is a very special waste. In fact, it is chemical waste. Think of all the, the medical tablets that we take, the, the pharmaceutical products, very nasty compounds. Think about the large percent of the female population taking uh, birth control pills. These are hormones, these are steroids, very rigid chemical structures that are hard to degrade in treatment systems. So the city of the future will have a factory at the end of the pipe. Now it is a small pipe, no big sewer systems needed uh, that collect all the urine from the city. And all these high-end products can be recovered and therefore this is an attractive business proposal. Next slide. Yeah, then new food. Um, think of it. We have come to the end of the shelf life of the Neolithic Revolution. We need new solutions. Uh, this could be uh, done in, in, in many different ways. Think about algae. Algae produce protein. Uh, if you calculate for 9 billion people, you would need the, the surface area of three times the size of Portugal the country of Portugal, but, and that's a lot of surface area, but uh, uh, to, to generate indeed enough protein and calories to feed the world population. But, but you can use the oceans, you can use the coastal waters for that. Uh, so, so that could be one. Another one is uh, uh, upscaling a technology that already exists. It is tissue culture. On the left side, you see a photo in the laboratory, we can grow tissue cells. A single cell, a single beef cell can be grown into layers. 
Scaling it up means you do this at a large scale and think of the city of the future. It would produce meat in factories. And then uh, people tell me, oh, but, but that doesn't sound very romantic. Uh, I get my steak out of a factory. Well, first of all, to those uh, who are critical, I would say uh, this would be the bulk of production in the year 2060 or 70, maybe. Uh, the, 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 the agriculture will still exist. The cows will still be out there, but it will become a luxury product. Like today, hunting is a, is a luxury product in the West. Uh, but we would, we would transfer from the Neolithic Revolution somewhere towards the end of this century into uh, taking it in our own hands and producing uh, beef and, and meat and, and the highest quality meat can be produced in factories. And I think of it now, you have full recycle of water, you have uh, only the dosage of nutrients that go into the proteins and into the product. And you no longer have the massive waste. You also no longer have the ethical questions around the bio industry. Next slide. So then you say, well, is that science or science fiction? Well, in 2013, the first hamburger was produced using this technology. This was done in the University of Maastricht in the south of the Netherlands. And it was a project sponsored by one of the co-founders of Google, who thought this was a, a very interesting project. Um, this project uh, uh, had a budget of $330,000, so I call it the stake of the heart, but it was just to prove the business case that it can be done. Uh, of course, uh, innovation goes exponentially, and in the year 2060, you would produce the same hamburger for $1. Next slide. And this is to end, and, and uh, just uh, request you, all of you again, that uh, while you do your studies in the water sector, try to imagine the future and the position of water in that new future. Uh, one thing must be certain, that future needs to be a sustainable future. Thank you very much for your attention. Next slide. Thank you very, very much for your colorful, imaginative and enthusiastic presentation, as always, really wonderful. Um, unfortunately, we do not have a lot of time for questions, but um, the first one is I'm going to appear to get at least an idea of how the question and answer uh, approach is working. This question sheet that you're going to see also has the possibility of sending more questions to you. The hashtag is made yeah. <laughs> next to the trip sign. Yeah, yeah, it's clear. clear. To and this is the, the, the key question, uh, but probably the most difficult question. It is clear that this, uh, we have followed the path to its unsustainability exactly because population exploded in the last uh, five, six decades. Um, and we have gone beyond the carrying capacity of this planet. Uh, I think all of you know the, the concept of the ecological footprint. Now, today, uh, uh, if you analyze the ecological footprint of humanity on this planet today, it, it adds up to about 1.4 planet Earth. Well, the last time I checked, there is only one. So we have either 0.4 times too many um, uh, people, or we need 0.4 more planet. Or, as the current, as the G agenda proposes, uh, we need to live with it that we will still have to go through a population growth in the coming decades. A peak will be reached somewhere at 2060 or so, and then after that it will come down and stabilize. That's, that's, these are the demographic pictures and outlook. But then we will have to be sure that we make that uh, peak 
to, in the second half of the century in a sustainable manner. So it is a double, it is a dual challenge. We have to accommodate more of us on this planet and we have to rebalance our ecological footprint. The, 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 the question about uh, population growth is of course a big picture question and a very difficult one. Uh, the UN believes strongly that if we manage to eradicate poverty, that then also we will be able to manage uh, population growth. But that clearly is a longer term issue that takes much more time. In the meantime, we have to work on reducing our ecological footprint per person significantly. Martin? Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we have no more time for next questions because uh, it is 46 already, one minute past our deadline. Moreover, you have to rush to the airport, I have understood. So once more, thank you so much for your time here and uh, sharing with us your views and your very broad knowledge of, collected over the past many decades. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, this is again also from this web seminar, the first one, and I can already tell you that uh, the next one is on 23 of November. Uh, given by Professor Joita Gupta, an expert in our institute in the area of governance and a very gifted speaker. Um, I want to quickly thank a few more people that have been involved in putting this whole show together. Um, I started off with Maria Laura, the driving force between, behind everything related to alumni relations. Maria, thank you for bringing this idea in reality. And move them in the same direction. We need our alumni, they're very important. Uh, I want to thank those in the world that have uh, listened with us. You may have seen the number at a certain moment, it we reached nearly 90. Uh, wherever they are located, we don't have the uh, locations yet. Um, and of course, we thank you here in the audience. Thank you for being present and for uh, Ken that he allowed us to. Oh yeah, that's coming. <coughs> that he allowed us to be part of this in this uh, seminar. And although you didn't see them, there's a whole army sitting in one of the rooms here that was fully ready in uh, entering the very many expected uh, Twitter questions that come in and to sort them according to importance and topic and to deliver them to you, which unfortunately time-wise didn't work out. Next time we are even more strict with our speakers.